and we're recording. Here we go. As different attendees come in, Kathy, hello, hello, John, Lisa. Oh, people flooding in. Thank you for coming in and coming in early. So, Emma, hello. Um, we'll just give everyone a couple of more minutes. Like um, we're, we're scheduled to start at two o'clock, so we've got we're here five minutes early, which is always good. Diego, good to see you here. Good to see you online, Catherine. It's like um, someone said this is a little like play school. I can see you through the window. <laughs> Um, Ellie, Kathy, uh, Ferry, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Jackie Grok, thank you. Oh, Jess Matchin, hello, how are you? Jess, I'm doing you. Julianne Moore, lovely to see you here as well. Lexi Reeves, Trish, good to see you joining us. Everyone from their homes, I imagine, or some may be still at their places of work. It's lovely to have you here. Christina, thank you for joining us. We've got about 20 people online at the moment as we start to build up the numbers. Baronga, hello, welcome back. Thank you so much for your wonderful support through the last couple of uh, transmissions, broadcasts. Um, so we just kind of keep moving in. We've got a number of panelists here. We are scheduled to start at two o'clock, so we're just holding court until that can happen. Um, we have the wonderful Leanne Buckskin online as well. Good to see you, Leanne. Are you in Adelaide, I imagine? I am in Adelaide. Yes, lovely Adelaide. We're expecting rain today, which will be very nice. Oh, we have a good rain. Goodness. Fred Gesher, hello. Good to see you here. Um, we've got 26 people online. More coming in every, every tick of the clock. So, which is great. Hi, Andy Donovan. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Andy, the room is live. So just, <laughs> just so you know that we're having conversations with that before. Just in case you want to say anything that may be no. appropriate. No, I would never do that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, Penny Smith, good day. Nick Horder, thank you very much for joining us. Rachel Fry, Robert Andrew, Steve Burns. Just kind of ricking. Oh, Luke Curry Richardson. Hello, Luke. Good to see you here. Thank you for joining us. Hope everyone is well and safe and looking after their families um, all around this country as we keep dealing with different news along the way. Um, we're just waiting, letting people kind of come in through. We are scheduled to start at two o'clock, so we've got a couple more minutes before then as well. Um, yes, as I was saying before, Leanne Buckskin and I co-hosting today uh, as we kind of move through from different parts of the country. I'm in Sydney at the moment and Leanne is in Adelaide, gorgeous Adelaide, where it's going to be, it's been raining in Sydney actually. I think there's a bit of rain around the country, which when you think just a couple of months ago, we were dealing with fires everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's um, It's very interesting to to do. Uh, Kerry, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Welcome. Uh, Andrew, Toby, hello. Welcome back. Great to have your support over these last couple of them. Uh, Eva Grace, gorgeous one. Oh, goodness. I need, I owe you an email, Eva Grace. We need to start talking about a project together, don't we? Don't we? See how that all goes out. Good to see you there. Yes, we've got about 44 people online at the moment as we get more people coming in. Um, lovely to have you all here and to see so many people, you know, alive and supportive. Ludmilla Donovan, lovely to see you, Ludmilla. Great to have you online, dear friend. Um, you're all dear friends, but some I've known longer than others. Um, Michael Hutchings is joining us on the line at the moment and it's Michael Hutchings' birthday today. So happy birthday to you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's, it's just turned two o'clock and we've got about 48 Hello. people on, online at the moment. We might just give everyone just a little bit longer to come on board just because it is scheduled to happen at two. So people are negotiating the technology to get on board and uh, be here. So great to see you. Oh, dear Perkins. Hello, lovely. Good to have you here. Stephanie Parkin, Cuz, how are you going? Good to have you on board. Amanda Healy, yes. Kaya to you and everyone. 
Um, uh, Jason Passfield, g'day. Good to see our Western Australian mob coming on board because, um, you know, it's a little bit earlier in the morning for you, but not too early, I think. Everyone's up. Joanne Dre Dreesen, thank you very much for coming on board. Um, Georgia, how good to see you, Georgia. Um, from Nava, got to have you on board. Hopefully we can give you some support and some uh, new thoughts as well to pass on to your members along the way as well. Uh, we've got 65 attendees. We'll just give everyone a couple more moments to come on board. Um, as I was saying, Leanne Buxkin and I co-hosting today, holding hands over halfway through the, over the continent as we get through. Wesley, I just noted that we have some friends from Spain joining us. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Our hearts so go out to you. Welcome. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a big thing happening in Spain. Goodness. Mm. And just... I know that we're, we're very much kind of sending our love to everyone there. John Mundine is in the house. John, good to see you. Warren Mason, thank you for coming on board. From in Tassie, which is great, sending good vibes down to Tassie. Um, Alison Williams, looking good. You're looking good. I'm looking good. We're all looking good. It's the, it's the front fill, isn't it? It's the warm front fill light. We've got 78 people in, uh, in with us at the moment as we get more and more people uh, into the room. Daniel Riley, good to see you. Thank you for coming. Deborah Linus, thank you. Uh, Alan Van Neven, hello. Hello, great to see you. Um, more and more people joining. Uh, um, Ian Collis, thank you for coming and, and joining us. Janet Vost. Uh, Jenna Robertson, thank you for joining us here. Um, 82 people here at the moment. It feels like I'm on an FM station. Hello and welcome to FM Blackfella. Maybe not. Stick to my day job, people are saying. Maybe, maybe I should. Yes, Deborah Linus, thank you uh, from Inner Western Sydney. Great to have you here. This is a great opportunity too, folks. We'll start in just a couple of minutes as we now up to 83 people in the room. Uh, we'll start in a couple of minutes as we just let other people join us. It's a great thing if you if you haven't seen it already, if you hover down your cursor down the bottom of the window, there's something called chat. You can just click on that and open the chat window. Uh, there's also a little uh, icon called Q&A. You can click on that and open the Q&A um, window box so you can then just throw in any questions you might want to ask there. We'll try to answer some of them live, but we'll also be able to answer them uh, if not now, then in the future as well, just coming back and answering them. Um, if you see things kind of coming together as well. Um, oh, you're right. The, the custodianship program members are joining us as well. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming. It's, uh, like, it's like I'm at the front door of the, of the party. And in fact, someone said that this, they, they, they called this the hour of power the other day like it's a it's a religious kind of gathering as well so i'll try to live up to my name wesley enoch good religious name as well <laughs> so we'll see i uh, welcoming you at the at the front door as you're coming in joe clancy good to see you thank you so much josh Rid ridgeway um folks it's it's five past two and more people may join us as we go along but we might get a a, a bit of a wriggle on and um move our way through uh, the, the uh, proceedings today. We've got an hour and a half today to, to go through all of this, a um, uh, couple of guest speakers and some of the material that's come through as well. All right, we're about to hit 100 people and I think that's a good time to start. What do you think, Leanne? I think so, let's get, let's get moving on. Um... All right, well, um, as you'll see there, welcome to the First Nations Arts Roundtable talking about mental and spiritual health and well-being today. It's the 3rd of April, 2020. I'm Wesley Enoch. Um, I'm the chair of the First Nations Strategy Panel here at the Australia Council, as well as being a, a, a Kwandamuka man from just off the coast of Brisbane, Kwandamuka country there. And joining me uh, as my co-host is the lovely Leanne Buckskin. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Wesley. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Leanne, I'm Deputy Chair of Australia Council for the Arts. I'm a Narunga Wurrungal Wajabalik woman from South Australia and um, very much looking forward to 
uh, hearing our speakers today and um, thank you to all of you for joining us. So, so go on to the next slide. Uh, we're just trying to get all of that to work out. The next slide. There we go. And even the next slide after that. Thank you. Just reminding us all that the reason why these roundtables were set up, we're really looking at how we connect to each other, how we share the, the ideas we might have and, and the other things that might be um, on our minds, on our hearts. The idea of giving new ideas to how we might be able to solve or, or work our way through some of the situations we're finding ourselves in around the country to build up these networks and also to help navigate what the information is and how we can move uh, forward along the way as well. We might just move to the next slide. Yep. We've got a number of things here to, to get through, but just to, to look at the focus today being on mental and spiritual health and well-being. That's come through from a number of you as we've, we've talked through the last two weeks of these roundtables. The a little bit of housekeeping, which I'll go through in a second in terms of the agenda, we'll go through some of the key issues and questions arising from last week's webinar. Uh, we'll have a grants update, especially looking at the four-year funding. We've got three guests, uh, Joshua Petha, who's a performance artist and a pharmacist, and he'll talk about his practice and what's going on. Wayne Barker, who's a coordinator of festivals and events from Cullark, the wonderful Wayne Barker, and the equally wonderful, as they all are wonderful, Professor uh, Kerry Arabina, who's the managing director of uh, Carabina Consulting. Uh, Arabina Consulting. Oh, Carabina Consulting. Oh, there we go. Um, we'll clarify that. Um, and just a little pulse check to seeing out what's going on and around, uh, how you're feeling and what's next, what can we do, and a few resources along the way. We'll, we'll talk about that. But I might hand over to, to Leanne. Do you want to acknowledge country from where we all are and how we're all meeting together? Yeah. Um, thanks, Wesley. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge um, all of our respective countrymen joining us today. And um, I acknowledge that I sit on Ghana land and I acknowledge uh, the elders, uh, both past and present and emerging, and also acknowledge our ancestors that gather around us during this really um, unique time. And um, just acknowledging all of your uh, ancestors who uh, surround you in every uh, corner of our lovely country. Thanks, Wesley. So many things. There's 114 of us online and there'll be more gathering as we do from all over the country. Um, just to go through, uh, I wanted to just move on to uh, the, the housekeeping slide, which is the next slide along. Um, sorry if I have to say this at times, we're, we're giving instructions to different people in different parts of the world. So just to look at um, the, before we look at the key speakers, just to run through some of the things that uh, you can do as part of watching this webinar as we go through. At the bottom of the screen, you can see a few ways that you can participate in the round table. If you just look down, there's a little icon, which is chat. If you hover your, your um, cursor down there, it's where you can send messages to other participants. You can actually send them specifically to another participant or to everyone along the way. Uh, make sure you click on the arrow next to two to select who the panelist is. If you open up that box, you can have a little look at that as well. And then just along, if you hover along, you can see the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, where if you have questions that you'd like to uh, us to address, either the, the round table members or maybe for future round tables or questions you might have that we can maybe answer live, you can put a question in there and it'll pop up in front of us here and we'll be able to do that. And you can also raise a hand, which, I think I've got one person with their hand raised now, but I can't actually see who it is at this point in time. Um, like, uh, I'm just kind of looking at, I can see that there's there, but I can't make that open up. But so I can't quite see. Oh, there it is right in front of me, Deirdre. Uh, there you go, Deirdre. You, uh, you're, you're able to talk to us, Deirdre, if you wanted to say something right now. Oh, Deirdre from South Africa. <clears throat> Hi. Deidre's got a hand up. Yeah. No, she she's not speaking. All right, that's good. I know how the system works a little better now, so that's great. That so if you do want to raise your hand, you can, and um, hopefully I'll be able to see it here on the screen. And between Leanne and I, we'll be able to say, oh, if someone has a specific question or something to say, we can do there. And also, there's closed captioning. If in fact the your sounds not so good or your hearing needs a little bit more support, 
we can look at there as well. Is there a way to see, Baragas looks at who, is a way of seeing who's in the room, please? Yes, if you go down to the little icon that says participants, you can see there's 131 of us, by the looks of it, yes, 131 of us in the room at the moment. If you click on that, um, and then just make sure you look at participants, you will be able to see lots of people's names. Actually, no, yeah, attendees is what you need. Just making sure that you go under participants, click on it, open and go to attendees. You'll be able to see everyone in alphabetical order. I didn't realize it's alphabetical order. There we go. Um, Anastasia Charles, Andrew Toby, Bianca Beardson. Oh, yes, lots of people in alphabetical order. I hope that's answered your question there, Baranga. Okay. All right. So there's lots of that kind of housekeeping to look at and to, to go through there. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Uh, we've just got um, some of the questions that came out of last week's uh, round table and some information as well for everyone who's out there. So I'll just go through this, Leanne, because I was there last yeah, week too, and yeah. I'll give everyone a rest from my voice in a second. Um, so just looking at the, the launch of the Indigenous Women's Arts Support Program in Cairns. So you're if in the tropical north of, of Queensland, you might be able to pack, pack your bags or have a little connection into the stuff happening in Cairns so you can work it from home on your art um, it's, uh, if you're on the NDIS. So wonderful program to have a little look at there. The New South Wales Business Connect offering four sessions free to review your business and assist you resourcing and financing. So especially if you're, I guess, a sole trader or a small business, that might be very useful. Local councils are looking at packages to support their local artists, particularly in the west of Sydney. But if you kind of reach out to your arts and cultural workers in your local uh, government jurisdictions, there might be some help there as well. Um, online events that are being launched, uh, Moogle Live, I think I've got that right as my pronunciation. This is uh, a way of generating paid gig for artists online. And Travis DeVries also launched Awesome Black uh, for artists and audiences highlighting the internet, uh, what the internet provides for large audiences, which enables funding and advertising. You can check out that um, both those uh, places from our previous talks as well. Uh, and uh, Songlines Aboriginal Music is leading a First Nations music survey to capture the loss of performances and lost uh, work lost in Victoria. And there's also some live streaming gigs throughout Victoria. So if you're down there in Coolin Country or, or beyond in other parts of Victoria, reach out to Songlines Aboriginal Music and look at that survey and those opportunities as well. And 70% of work coming out of art centres in Northern Territory is made by women. This was a really fascinating uh, um, uh, paper that was given last week. Uh, women over 50 years of age who are the foundation of communities um, highlighted the huge loss to artists and the cancellation of art fairs across the country. And um, you can also register now for Australia Council's webinar series, Creative Connections with Terry Janke, discussing protocols in the digital space. There was a lot coming through, especially from our amazing guest speakers. So you can get in, get in, in, in touch and have a look at um, what's come, coming through there for uh, different, different people. And all of this information is up online at the Australia Council. You can check that out as well. Um, Elaine Crombie saying that um, the MEAA, the, uh, uh, the arts union, if you like, have online actions last week and this week, and they've been getting a few wins. Yes, we've seen that as well. People talking about the arts and creative industries um, throughout in terms of new policy directions. And Lily Shearer saying, great, that Terry Janke, yep, great, happy, oh, happy 20 years. In fact, it's the 20th anniversary of Terry Janke's setting up her own business. So it's a, that's a wonderful thing to celebrate as well. So check out a few things there as they're coming through in the chat box. Goodness, if we go to the next slide, a little bit of a grants update. I might hand over to you, Leanne. Thank you. Thanks, Wesley. Um, look, before we get into um, hearing from our guest speakers, uh, we've got uh, Andy Donovan uh, from the Australia Council. Um, he's our uh, Director of Multi-Year Funding, um, Arts and Investment. And what uh, Andy's going to take you through is some of the work that we've been doing um, behind the scenes. Our executive team at the Australia Council have been literally working 24-7 um, to look at um, bringing a whole range of um, initiatives in terms of what we're facing with COVID-19. 
So, um, Andy, I'm going to hand straight over to you. I know that you're really busy at the moment, and I understand that once you de deliver this, um, that you're, we'll let you loose. And I get will. To I'll the... disappear. <laughs> but thank you, you so much for your time, too. Um, jump Andy. forward to, those, to the relevant slide there, Michelle, so that we can, Andy can talk to those slides then. And we'll come back to those other slides. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay. So, just to talk about our um, uh, response package at the moment in terms of the COVID nineteen uh, situation. Sorry, Michelle, to move forward to the four year funding slide, which is a little. Oh, bit great. Long. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you'll come back on these ones. Okay. Yeah, we'll come back on this then. Yeah. There we go. Here we go. So. Um, uh, good afternoon uh, and probably good morning for a few of you. Um, uh, just to run through what we've done, we've just uh, made the announcements, uh, made sent out uh, notification emails for the four-year funding um, for organisations program. So um, um, obviously we're getting a lot of uh, calls and responses back from people. Uh, but a summary of what's gone on um, is um, essentially we've provided funding for 95 uh, organisations. Uh, so they'll be the... Uh, the 95 four-year funded organisations uh, from 2021 to 24. Uh, that includes 28 new organisations. So previously we had uh, around about 100 and uh, around about 120 um, funded. Um, sorry, I keep getting phone calls on my computer. Uh, uh, around about 120 funded. Uh, so uh, there's a decrease in the number of organisations we're supporting. Um, however, uh, because of COVID-19, we've also been doing a lot of work to look at the budget for that four-year funding across the organisations that we currently fund uh, through the four-year funding program and also those new entrants uh, that I mentioned earlier, the 28. Uh, so what we've decided to do is um, um, kind of sort of balance the funding between the existing four-year funding organisations and those new four-year funding organisations. So we will be extending the contract uh, of all of the existing four-year funded organisations, or most of them, uh, for 12 months. Uh, so that's 49 companies uh, that are currently receiving four-year funding will actually get an extra year of funding uh, for 2021. However, it won't be at the level they currently are receiving support. It'll be at, at approximately 70% of that level. Uh, and the same will go for the new uh, 28 organisations that are coming into the four-year funding. They will also have their first year uh, of four-year funding set at that 70% of the grant request level. Uh, and so that really is about us trying to spread as much as possible um, the opportunities for organisations to uh, to work their way through through this COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, it was obviously going to be very, very odd if we were to um, uh, stop supporting those existing four-year funded organisations this year, because really, I mean, the, the, the level of activity that people are able to do uh, over the next six to nine months is going to be severely impacted. Uh, and, and as you all know, we're all in uh, the mode of just trying to get through the crisis uh, and, uh, and we want to have as many companies get through the crisis and, and, and be on the other side as possible. So that was the, uh, the reason behind us trying to, I, I guess, really work to, to balance that, that, that program. This is all funded within the budget of the Australia Council. I'm, I hasten to add, it's not any extra money that's come uh, into us. Uh, so that's why it's taken a little bit longer to make these announcements because we really have been um, uh, uh, working quite <laughs> quite a lot to try and get the, the calculations right uh, uh, across across the board. So uh, it's not an ideal situation, but uh, hopefully it will assist uh, those existing uh, organisations uh, to manage um, uh, manage their, uh, those the existing organisations that have lost, lost funding to manage their way through COVID and, and then 2021. Andrew, just to confirm that uh, Marilyn Miller says 70% sounds like a good transition. And so those who are already getting uh, ongoing support will get 70% for the next year coming forward. That's uh, right. They'll be able to modify some of their um, programs then and that it's only 70%? Absolutely. So we'll, we'll, uh, we can um, 
uh, we're obviously looking at the, the programs for this year because they'll obviously have to be modified, but you know, I fully anticipate in 2021, uh, there'll be some serious modification to what people have proposed as well as we, as we make this adjustment uh, back into uh, some sense of normality uh, after the COVID crisis. So just going on to the next slide there, Michelle, that's FYF is four year funded, I guess. Two um, yes. Looking at those that are, that are already funded, as Andrew was saying, this notion of 70% of the, uh, the monies that you were getting under a four year funded arrangement for the next year, will they have to apply again next year or will... No, no, so we will actually extend the contracts of those existing organisations. Uh, through to the end of 2021, uh, and obviously the the new organisations uh, and the and those that have uh, been uh, approved for four year funding from 21 to 24 will will get new contracts going uh, around October this year. Marvellous. So in, we'll we'll see at least some kind of continuation between uh, for the next 12 months for those companies who are currently on four year funding and those new organisations who are coming online as well. Correct. So great, great kind of transition as we get through. Um, some people are asking for a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes, all of this PowerPoint will go up online at the Australia Council website uh, as soon as all of, this, all of this is being recorded and will be able to go up as well. Um, a few people talking, uh, Elaine Crombie saying that uh, the MEAA is through an online gathering of stories. So if you have a story, um, she put the website uh, link up there before. You can check out that. And also Kerry Shine talking about free writing mentorships in Newcastle or in, in surrounds for people with a disability or working in disability area. You can check out talking to Kerry Shine as well. Um, Andrew, there's so much, so much there, and I'm sure everyone's incredibly mindful of all that stuff, that you're know, trying to keep everyone going with with 70% of, of yes. your funds. Um, and I think that that's, I, we can all appreciate that's a very tricky thing. Do you, do you see any other relationships with the states uh, in terms of their initiatives or how they're coping with it along the way with these four-year funded organisations? Uh, look, we're in very close contact with the states. And in fact, I'll be going into a series of meetings uh, with them uh, next week uh, to work through um, obviously this information but also work through some of the budget modelling we have been doing internally on uh, the four year funded organisations. Uh, part of that really is to, tr is to work with them to, to make sure that they agree with sort of the, the, the position that we're seeing um, and so obviously we are trying to work towards understanding how many organisations um, will be eligible for the job keeper. Uh, arrangements that the government has put in place uh, and and where there might be gaps uh, and uh, hopefully then um, uh, we'll be able to make representations to the government to perhaps you know provide some funding to fill some of those gaps but you know it's it's a very difficult situation because obviously every industry across the country is uh, is is suffering so um, we need to be mindful that, uh, that, that the government itself finds itself in a very difficult position but they are certainly looking towards uh, those initiatives like jobkeeper uh, as as the key ones uh, for organization survival mm -hmm. Wonderful. We, we, we have um, 151 people online at the moment listening to this story, and I'm, I think it's very important that we get it out there. So what I'm hearing you say too is, if you are an organisation that currently employs people, go for the JobKeeper support as well, uh, which offers basically... Well, at, this, at least at this point, register your interest in it. Um, right. and, and there's obviously a lot of detail that will need to, to come after that, but I think it's important that, that arts organisations get on the, on the register to sort, of, to sort of say we're interested. Yeah, that would be great to support as many people as you can. Um, Nicole just asked a quick, quick question here. Uh, will there be an application round for new organisations in 2021 or is that process finished now for only those in that cohort? That's right. So this is a process we only run every four years. Uh, so um, there, there'll be, uh, there won't be this opportunity available for these uh, applications again until 2023, yes. I think. <laughs> Uh, it, it's hard to even think about time, isn't it? It's so far away. At the, mo at the moment it is, yes. <laughs> um, Andrew, thank you so much for that update. It's really great to, to see how we can help support these organisations through this process. Um, Michelle, we might go back to the slides a bit earlier about what the Australia Council is doing, just looking at the grants update. Just um, as, as we move back to that slide, just the, the, the sense then of, we said this last week as well, but just good to remind everyone that um, 
just the Australia Council's changing the arrangements and remaining quite flexible around uh, removing requirements to meet audience KPIs, knowing that's going to be very difficult in the future, bringing forward payments if you need payments now rather than in you know, a couple of months' time, see if they can bring them forward, and delaying and simplifying reporting requirements, varying the purposes and outcomes of the funding. We're talking to Andrew then about if you do need to change what you said you were going to do and modify that so that you can do it within the budget, in that case of 70%, but also within the time frames, you can't do what you were trying to do before, talk to people about simplifying the reporting or the outcomes of what you're doing and extending the timelines for projects. So there's lots of things to do there and allowing organizations to use money provided for the deliverable to a repurposed or to pay essential bills such as wages, rent and utilities. So if you need to, you can actually just ring your project officer or your grants officer at the Australia Council and ask for some advice and some support if you need to repurpose those monies to support yourself and your rent and your family and, and things that are, that are very, very important as we go forward. Um, next slide there, um, Michelle. And just the idea, of, just putting them into little informatics there, the idea of there's also this, uh, these sector roundtables being very important, how the Australia Council is looking after First Nations, suspending current investment programs and introducing new ones to help support everyone, and the research and analysis, looking at how we can support people into the future and also this idea of the digital support and online learning series. How do we kind of keep building our skills online as we go through? And just to talk a little bit about the 2020 Resilience Fund. Andrew, I don't know if you're, you're skilled up on the 2020 Resilience Fund or not, or? I know a little of it, yes. Well, it, basically it says here there are three streams looking yep. at to, to just go to the next slide there, Michelle. The Survive, Yep. So survive the small grants for individuals, groups and organisations. That'll yep. be open very soon. So that's a very, that, that's the sort of the really quick response one for people who really do find themselves uh, sort of in an emergency situation. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of smaller grants, but very, very, that we can get to people quite responsibly. The adapt the grants for individuals, groups and organisations to adapt their practice. What does that mean? So that's about, okay, we're all going to be stuck inside, but... <laughs> who knows how long uh, so what are the ways that you can adapt your practice to that new environment and and so those grants are really about how can you how can you be create you know how can you think about how you can present your work in a completely different mode if if if, if the digital mode is not the one that you're used to and then also to create grants for individuals and groups to continue their artistic work well and that's probably um, probably the most important because the one thing we don't want people to stop doing is being creative and stop and making work and so this is really in recognition of that um, that you know we really want organizations individuals and groups to continue to create artistic work either uh, within the context of, of the situation we find ourselves in but also in the context of a, of a post COVID world as well Marvellous. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, there's one more thing I wouldn't mind getting some advice on from people that we're talking about the Arts and Disability Mentoring Initiative, which have been reopened. I guess this is for everyone's information more than anything else. The Australia Council for the Arts is offering six grants of $30,000 in each Arts and Disability Mentoring Initiative round. Um, people who are in the know would know what that means and, and you can get in there and support artists or people working um, in the disability, arts and disability area. And if you're an individual artist or arts worker with a disability, these grants can provide support to extend your arts practice and network skills and ambition. Uh, and also the new closing date at midnight on Tuesday, the 14th of April, that's Eastern summer time. So that, that's uh, uh, Sydney time, Melbourne time uh, in that way, if you wanna put that forward as well. Um, anything else from you, Andrew? No, I think that's all. I, I really need to rush off to another meeting now. So all right, thank sorry. you all. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew, for all your time there. No worries. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. I've got a question here from Dan Mitchell. Um, are Survive, Adapt and Create, are they live yet? So, Andrew, you can go and we'll, we'll get that answer from... They're live today. Oh, today. There we go. On the 3rd of April. It does, in fact, say that there. On the 3rd of April, you can contact your grants officer. To, uh, to look at that. So today those survive, adapt and create uh, funds are open and live and you can get in there. Thank you, Andrew, Zane Saunders, Lily Shearer, Shannon Brett, all saying thank you so much uh, for that information as we go forward. Oh, Leanne, I could talk under wet cement, couldn't I? <laughs> it's just what happens. Um, leads us to our 
our guest speakers now uh, as we go through. Um, if we go to the, the next slide that talks about guest panelists, please, Michelle. Sorry, jumping around the slide deck there a little. Uh, we've got our, our, our three speakers. And um, Leanne, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you. So hi everybody. Um, we'll get we'll hook straight into our, our guest speakers. Um, today we've invited three wonderful people to join us to talk about mental uh, and spiritual health and well-being. Um, so as we all are facing very challenging and difficult times with um, with COVID, and so you know personally I. In, and, you know, speaking for Australia Council as well, we're very much um, mindful of the anxiety and isolation that people are facing. And there's also a sense of displacement as well. You know, those who are, um, you know, a, a distance from their families as well. So that it's a very difficult time to negotiate. So, you know, I think everybody um, just do the best that we can, um, you know, be kind to one another. Um, and know that there are people working in the background uh, at the moment, working incredibly hard and diligently to try and uh, come up with um, flexible ideas and the way in which, you know, our extraordinary arts community can continue to keep practicing um, during this time. So our guests today, uh, we have Joshua, Wayne Barker and, uh, and Professor Kerry Arabina. Um, we're going to kick off with um, the lovely Joshua Pether. Joshua, we're going to hand over to you and basically I want to introduce you, I'll get you to talk about yourself uh, and your practice. Uh, you're a performance artist and you're a pharmacist as well. So that's a really interesting combination. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, how you combine those, those two practices together. So I'm going to hand over to you, Joshua. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leanne. And um, hello, Wesley. And um, g'day, everybody. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Joshua Pether. And I'm um, originally from Mount Isa, so Calcadine. But I live here in Noongabudja, which is in Perth, Western Australia. Um, and yeah, as Leanne um, mentioned, I have a dual sort of um, work practice, one being uh, working in the arts and the other is a pharmacist. And so um, I suppose like how I managed to integrate the two, um, I'm still sort of coming to terms with because in many ways I sort of saw it as two separate um, practices as opposed to like one unified sort of part of my practice. And so um, what I'm interested in at the moment, especially with the situation we're in currently, is how do I able, how am I still able to continue an arts practice and at the same time also um, Take, you know, take on board um, pharmacy as well, because as, as this situation evolves, um, people like myself, um, people in the food industry will potentially have um, viable employment like for the, for the rest of um, this whole situation. Um, so I sort of feel I'm quite in a interesting situation where um, I sort of feel like in, in terms of everybody else, I, I have a job. I'm secure, but at the same time, it's the involves me going out into the wilderness and exposing myself to potential dangers outside. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the things that um, I'd like to sort of discuss a bit today about like how um, health and the arts can sort of come together as sort of like a uh, a unified sort of voice and practice and how if if you did want to um, you know um, look into this idea of working in health because I think it'll be a viable industry as we look forward as we go into the future how you're able to do that and still continue an arts practice um, but I might just go to the next slide um, which is sort of like two different versions of myself which is really interesting because I think my practice sort of um, looks at uh, the, the integration of disability and also um, indigeneity and how those two sort of integrate and sort of entwine into each other. And at the same time, I also have this other very 
interesting part of my life, which is pharmacy. And I've actually been working on a, um, an academic sort of research book, which um, is in regards to crip time and disability. And I've had to really think about where I got this idea of being a pharmacist and where that came from. And to this day, I really don't know. And I'm wondering if it's now, this is the point in time in which the calling for, the pharmac for being a pharmacist is actually, this is the calling now in terms of a crisis. And so being at that front line of, um, you know, health. And in many ways, people may not think that pharmacists are at that front line, but we are because often um, people will come to us before they go to doctors or nurses because it's free. You can just walk into a pharmacy, you can ask them, you know, um, for free health advice. And as we're finding out through this virus, it's actually in many ways, for a lot of people it's asymptomatic. So people aren't actually coming in with symptoms. And so I'm sort of waiting um, every day for a phone call from the Department of Health saying, oh, you know, you, know, you might be potentially exposed to someone with COVID-19. So in many ways, what's happened is I've began to look at my own mortality in a way, which is really interesting because I think as a Western society, that's something that we've never actually had to face or we're very, um, we're very, um, we don't really want to face it. And so I think this has actually allowed us to actually, you know, look at, look at this idea of mortality. And I think in many ways, um, the pharmacy industry and the health industry has tried to prolong that mortality um, beyond, of, beyond of what, you know, what the natural sort of um, cycle of life is. And so now maybe the idea of, you know, life being both birth, living and death can actually now be discussed in a more holistic manner, as opposed to like having death being a part, being separate from the actual reality of the life cycle. And I think a lot of communities, particularly Asian communities, understand that idea of death of it being part of the actual, you know, the life cycle. And I think what will happen eventually is with this situation as it evolves, people will become more and more exposed to this idea. And that, you know, it is actually part of life. I really do feel it's part of life. And I don't want to be morbid about it, but I think it's something that um, we have to we have to face because, you know, the reality is, I mean, the reality in America at the moment that they're expecting is that 100,000 deaths, that's a lot of people. And so how do, how does that community are able to grapple, you know, people dying on potential quite, uh, this quite sort of um, very, insidious illness because it's insidious because no one actually knows what what it does um, the information out there is that it's an animal virus so what's happened is it's been transferred from animals to humans and then now it's transferred from humans to humans and it's actually these animal viruses that are actually the most dangerous because as humans we don't have actual humanity to uh, sorry, immunity to it um, so with the flu, for instance, there is some degree of immunity to that um, because we've all been exposed to it. So the level of people that get exposed to the flu, um, even though what the statistics are saying to us is that um, flu will kill more people than this virus, the, the reality is that you do have some immunity to it. Whereas if you are exposed to this particular virus, there's very little immunity to it because it's an animal virus. And so in many ways, it seems that the animal world has taken over. And so I don't know about, it, about you, but whenever I go out, I see lots and lots of wildlife sort of scampering around and just having an amazing time. And it's, I think for me, that's a really beautiful thing to see because for many, you know, up until now, I almost felt like, we were taking over and we were just like, um, you know, being the most intense presence we could be on this world. And so now we've been told to go back home, think about what we've done and, you know, um, you know, try to um, sort of um, do better, basically. And I think um, this is, you know, I think this is the lesson we can learn from COVID-19 really is to actually 
you know, listen to the, listen to the natural world. Cause I think the natural world is really taking over at this point. And I see that as a positive rather than a negative because in many ways, you know, animals um, have a part in this world as well. It's not just human species as well. And so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a really provocative statement. And I suppose in many ways, um, my work is I am a provocateur. So I'd like to unpack this a bit. And I suppose I'll just under, you know, get to that point of where I've come to in terms of um, where the statements come from. And for me, the statements come from the experience of being in an industry that has, well, when, when we learned pharmacy in university, um, the idea was it's always been about the health. It's always been about the medicine. It's always been about the well-being of the patient. Um, when you get into a community setting, in particular, like in a in a business sort of community setting, and with the big corporations running them, it sort of becomes more inclined to like how do we make a profit or how do we you know? And I think it, the thing is though, everyone has to make you know money somewhere you know you've all learned we've all got to put a roof over our head we've all got to eat and that sort of thing um but somewhere along the lines i feel that um and i think it's a lot to do with government intervention over the years the government has really reduced um a lot of subsidies that um pharmacies were getting in terms of remuneration for certain things certain things they would do and so now we're having to look at this um sort of new model of like trying to I suppose, uh, yeah, financialised health in a way, which for me has been really difficult to um, grapple with. And so I suppose in a way that's where I've sort of seen the two difference of my, of my careers is like I'm a pharmacist but I'm also a performance artist because in many ways the, um, the morale, not the morality, but sort of like the um, ethical points of those two sort of um, practices I didn't see as sort of the one. But it's a really interesting situation now that we're coming to where I think actually the health industry is actually serving the community. It's actually been a real vocal, um, it's really been, it's actually quite interesting. It's been a real vocal voice in terms of, um, you know, um, how they want this situation to play out. But they're calling on, you know, really strict um, uh, measures in regards to containment because that's only that's the only way we're going to beat this is containment so the idea of like staying at home is actually really really important because once we start to leave our little um, safety nests that's when it becomes more and more difficult to track down where where the cases are coming from and so often you hear about people like that go that leave their quarantine and sort of like go out and about and all that sort of thing. And because it's this insidious virus that we actually don't know exactly how it affects people and people don't necessarily get sick from it, there's sort of this mentality in the community still to this day that um, it won't affect me. Um, but the thing is, like, it may not affect you, but then when we go to trace back where you've gone, you've gone to, like, five different places that potentially you've then affected, like, 20, 30, 40 different people. And then there's lots of interesting graphs, particularly on the face, in a lot of Facebook chats that sort of show you the exponential growth each time you go out to, you know, different places and then someone doesn't stay home and then that affects someone else and that's someone else. And so you get a lot, you know, we get community spread and that's exactly what's happening at the moment. And well, I know, Josh, we're talking a lot about, especially yeah. in rural and remote communities, uh, yeah. just looking at how we're shutting down those communities to make sure that um, elders are, are, are cared yeah. for in those kind of places. Um, a few kind of comments up here around also natural medicines that elders mm. and and. and um, people working in, in other medicine people about natural therapies and things. Is there much conversation you're having around those knowledges as well? Not in the medicine world, mainly because the information out there is not, um, we don't have any scientific, in terms of the Western scientific uh, um, narrative, there's actually no sort of information to sort of um, 
uh, sort of scientifically um, established that as a data point, um, which is really unfortunate. I don't think there's actually enough in, enough research being done in it, particularly. Other people out there might know a bit more. Um, but in terms of like the, the situation or the, play, the practice that I sort of work in, which is mainly, I suppose, the Western, Western standard of medicine, um, a lot of um, practitioners don't always consider um, natural medicine or, you know, Indigenous medicine as um, something that's a viable option, which is really unfortunate because I know a lot of the, you know, the older and the elders really cling to that. And I, I really do encourage people that if they are on, you know, whatever medicine they're on, um, do make sure you take it because it's going to come to a point where, stop we're going to get like less and less supplies of these medicines and so you're going to have to be really um frugal with what you um have at the moment and um yeah continue to do taking your medicine whatever that medicine is whether it's the western medicine whether it's the natural medicine because so i think in many ways like um you know having a healthy body having a healthy mind having a healthy spirit is going to really help us through this period of time uh, particularly as we come to a point where there's not going to be a lot of, um, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's sort of this very, uh, we're heading in a very murky territory where we actually don't know the future. And I think that's with everybody. No one knows how this is going to play out. Um, and I think it's really interesting, like at the moment with Australia, it sort of feels like we're at that point where people are sort of taking it seriously, but not. Um, they're still doing their day-to-day -day activities. They're not changing their behaviour. And I really blame the government for this in terms of the message being sent out. The message from, every, like from my perspective, the message was sent out so late because yeah. for everyone to isolate themselves, do this what's required, that requires a cultural shift. And that's at least, you know, a month potentially. Yeah. You know, we don't just do this in two, three weeks. Well, people are saying we should have closed the borders earlier. And, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, like, always like that. Like we're in Ireland. We're in Ireland. We're in the middle. We're the butthole world, basically. You know, <laughs> like you know, way down the bottom. Um, yeah. You know, we could have been a lucky country in terms of like being lucky country. Well, um, Deborah's got a question here. She's asking about is there any funding available for scientists to do research on the idea of natural and elder medicines? I, I, we'll leave that open. I guess we don't. Yeah, I think that, I think there could be. I mean, I think yeah. in a way like. This whole situation is really going to change the way that health is looked at. I really do believe that because it's really come to that point where health is really at this because they've been really vocal in terms of like we need to do the right thing for the health and not looking at the financial gain, whereas opposed to governments looking at more driving this sort of really interesting experiment where we're sending this people out to a you know, potentially quite dangerous situation, they're getting sick. And then you had to go back home, yep. you know, isolate yourself for two weeks. Yeah. Come back out. Gosh, we, we do yeah. have to wrap it up so we've got time for our yeah, other speakers. Absolutely. There's, there's yeah. a lot of interesting things. Um, Malian Slater Burns is saying, yes, Deb, it is happening. Some of that research is occurring out there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to know that research around natural and elders medicine. Josh, thank you so much for thank your you. insight. And lots of people saying on the chats here about, yes, keep a healthy body, keep a healthy mind, healthy spirit. Um, Lily Shearer saying that, in fact, uh, Berorina is closed. Uh, no one's allowed in or out and you can't return. Uh, her mum can't even come down for treatment, so they're flying her treatment to her, which is great. Mm -hmm. And taking your point too, Josh, about people who are on medications, keep taking those medications. Yes. Please. Make yes, sure you're frugal with it. Um, yeah. I'm sure no one wastes medications in this way, but just to look after it. Josh, thank you so much. I think there's some very important issues there that um, are being raised. Um, I might take us then on to the, uh, Wayne Barker, who is uh, our next speaker as, as he kind of comes on board and I kind of find out where my next piece of paper is. We love paper, here it is. Um, uh, Wayne is uh, joining us from Kalak and he's right there on the front line, I guess in many ways, uh, Wayne, Josh talking about uh, social, social isolation and, and keeping people at a bit of physical distancing. I know last week we talked, Ben Gratz talked about, yes, we're physically isolating or physically distancing but in fact we have to stay socially connected and how do we keep everyone safe so going on to the to wayne slide and um wayne i'll hand it over to you uh thanks wesley uh leanne and everybody else who's uh, who's on the on this chat line um yeah as you say we 
in the Kimberley region, we're really at the coalface in, in the context of the Kimberley, obviously, you know, everyone's battlefield is, is relevant to their own space and, 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 uh, con and traditional country. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, three matters. Um, basically explain what we're doing in terms of the, the Euromin project and the Red Certs project, which is our, our key principle under CALAC is to secure the wells, to secure the traditional honor knowledge laws and customs and practices that underpins our identity, underpins our relationship to land, our, our relationship to our society, and our relationship to our neighbours. Um, the cultural fabric and the structure of, of this, uh, what we call culture. Um, we, we, we take the view of what is culture, how does it define you, and then how does that then deliver well-being in the context of the 21st century. Um, so we concentrate our work mainly around uh, this intergenerational knowledge transfer. So taking uh, younger, younger men and women, uh, and in the Yerman project, it's, it's taking disenfranchised young people and putting them, thank you for that, I was about to click that. Um, so it's about building stories in our young people. Um, see, this is why we, 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 we like you, Wesley, you're right on it. Um, that the, the idea is that even in, in a Kimberley region where it is remote and, and, and law and culture is still relatively strong, we have main communities like Fitzroy and Halls Creek, Broome, Derby, uh, Kununurra, Wyndham, that are really um, uh, are centres of, of, of large uh, habitation and Aboriginal people have been forced into these con uh, confines of other, on other people's country, They're living on reserves mainly in homes, west houses and, and social housing. And you, and, you, and you create this environment of tension and uh, a new way of living and a new language and a new system of interrelating with each other, responding to each other, set within the context of traditional law and custom stru structures around kinship systems, uh, the way in which you relate uh, culturally, um, that's been architect by, by our, our, our ancients in the past. What you see is that as young men and women struggle to build their resilience to maintain both the, a footing in the white man's world and the, and the blackfellow world, is that the, the culture is fragile, is starting to slip in many, many spaces. And yes, it's in, in terms of some ritualized events that happen on uh, and seasons and what happens in the Kimberley around ceremonies and rituals, that's still very, very strong. But what we're seeing over time because of the assimilation of the compression of, of individuals in societies, what we're seeing is this, this slippage of the self-resilience that actually underpins people's good choices of making in their lives about whether or not they, you know, they, they struggle through, through identifying their place in the world. And, and that's been seen in the data of suicides and, and self-harm that, that sort of exploded across the region and right across the, right across the country. So Euromin is Kalak's attempt at trying to build a bridge by trying to build a connection between the young disenfranchised young people and taking them out in country so that they could, if you like, breathe in culture, absorb it, um, reaffirm it in their own sense of identity and self that they, they have, they are, if you like, in charge of their own lives and destiny. So they're not just puppets of, of programs and processes, that they're not just a number, that they're actually real people. And those real people have interconnectivity with others that, that build this relationship of, of tribe. Um, so that's what Yeraman is really about, is trying to build that story. So, and, and it's not just stories about telling stories of mythology, but it's telling stories of themselves and how they relate culturally to the land, to the place, to the people, to the elders and these old men that you're seeing in the slide. These young guys, they go out on six weeks camel trips. And so it's not just riding camels and having an affiliation with an animal, but it, and each other, it's, it's about actually taking a long period of time away from the confines of a, of a community, like, you know, like townships, and then putting them back on country where they, where they can actually exercise this whole idea of returning to country and being part of country. So that's what the Euromen project is about. And, and our attempts is trying to find the levers that allows younger men and women to integrate uh, with their cultural base. So if we move to the next slide, conscious of time, um, 
the Red Shirts project is, is something that we've, we've, in, um, we've begun as a way in which, when you look at the way in which Aboriginal communities, both mainstream and in remote communities, are dealing with self-determination, um, most of these men that you see in this picture are, are senior men who operate at the community council level. They, they, they're really the, the, the machinery that that's the transition between what happens in the community and what happens in the cultural space. But they're also sitting on community councils, they're sitting on PVCs, they're, they're, they're leading the discussions around contracts and um, you know, provisions of services for their people. So they're the spokesmen, if these are just the men, we have also women as well, they're called yellow shirts. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is how, to, how do we, in the same way that we did with the Yeriman project, is how do we build the resilience in these, young, these men who are they're not young now, you know, we're talking in their 40s, 30s and 40s, going on to 50s. Um, and how do we build their capacity to be able to speak authoritatively uh, to all of these different agencies that, that, that come to their communities, but based on what they carry with them, which is their legacy which is the legacy left to them by their elders. They are now the new leaders of, of our communities. They're the, they're the cultural spokesmen. They're the ones leading ceremonies. They're the ones leading the cultural resurgence that we've been trying to do under Kale. So we're putting a great deal of effort around this because if, if these men, uh, if we can't galvanize these guys and make, make them deliver, then what is the future for cultural practice and, and cultural vibrancy on our communities? It just, it's just not going to be there because these are the, these are the operators in the cultural and community and governance space. So this network of men right across the region from West Coast to Kimberley all the way through to Jirabal and across to Northern Territory, they're all linking together to make a new sense of governance and a new hierarchy, if you like, and, a, and a, what I call a cultural uh, highway links between the individuals. So they link together like any other network does. Uh, regional act activism happens because of a strong network. And this is the network that we're talking about and, and exists both with the red shirts in men and it also exists in yellow shirts in women. And I can talk about a number of projects that, that we do, but that, that uh, I, I'd like to move on because of, its, of, of the time that I have. And I'd like to move to the next slide. But just before we do, Wesley, you see this gentleman here? Can we go back one? Go back to the previous slide, please. That gentleman sitting on the right-hand bottom corner, this is Mr. Joe Brown. He is the most senior man in the Kimberley region. And he, we at Kalak work predominantly for him and men like him. And he has set out, these old men have set out a real, they understand what challenges that we are all facing. So it's under their direction that they say, well, build this capacity. That's, that's what the instructions are for, for the staff at KLA. So if we move to the next slide. These are the living libraries. These are the men and women that hold the cultural knowledge across this landscape, this cultural landscape that stretches from, in terms of the Kimberley, from the northern of the Pilbara side, which is the other side of um, uh, Sanfire, all the way right across to the Northern Territory border on the other side of Kananara, and then stretching right across to the East Coast to you know, within, within spitting distance of Lajamana. This area of traditional law and custom space is still vibrant. It produces a wealth of cultural knowledge and information that really gives, gives Aboriginal people in the Northwest a sense of strong identity and a strong sense of self. But it comes from these living, living libraries. It doesn't, does, it do, yes, it does exist in pages of research and other people, but it exists on a day-by-day -day basis by men and women of his calibre. Now, one of the things that, that has recently occurred as of yesterday is Mr. Joe Brown has, has instructed Kalak to send a message because of the COVID-19 situation to cease all cultural activity, including funerals right across the region. And we released that yesterday. Uh, sorry, we released it yesterday. And today uh, we put it up on Facebook and in within four hours, we got 5,000 views. So that, that gives you an ex example of the kind of um, weight men like him have in terms of getting the message across. But what it shows is, is leadership. And I stress this word, leadership. If a man like him can say there will be no more ceremonies, no more rituals, 
for the 17,000 Aboriginal people that live in the Kimberley region, just on his word, ceases. And that includes funerals. So, you know, you can imagine that here you've got a, a reaction from the health departments who are sending to the Kimberley truckloads of body bags, anticipating this massive um, deaths. And here's this old man saying, you can't even gather to, um, to, to, to say farewell to your loved ones. This is a really extraordinary example of strong leadership. And just looking at this gentleman, you can see that he contemplated this a lot. He did, this is not just something that, that he just thought of five minutes ago. This was something that he dwelled upon. Because up till now, what we've been saying is continue to engage in culture. It's been the most difficult for us to draw people into the cultural space. And now we're saying stop. But we're stopping because of this issue of COVID-19. That demonstrates real wisdom. You know, this is not a self-interest issue here for him. He, he feels absolutely compelled to save the culture as he possibly can as a living library himself. That's a powerful so, thing, Wayne. That's such a powerful thing. I mean, I, I think where 5,000 people respond within four hours, you just know that he's got such authority and such power. It's, it is amazing. And, and good luck. I mean, there's so much that needs to be done to support them. I know you've got a call to action as well that you really want to bring yeah, before. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. And I'll, I'll jump to the next slide um, as well. And so what we've done is Kalak has, has um, contemplated this over the last two weeks. Now, this has come from the frustration that we've felt, even though we've, we've been alerted to, the, to this depending uh, COVID-19 issue. Um, and all our pleas to the government agencies to respond quicker than they have have fallen on deaf ears. So as with all things, it, it always comes to the relative few, led by men like uh, senior bosses, like managers, like Mr. Wy uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Wise, Mr. Malachi Hobbs, all of these others, and generations of people in that painting behind you, Leanne, you know, the, these, these, these families, you know, strong cultural families that say, no, we've got to, we've got to act. And if we can't act because on the governance level, because our government's not listening to us, then we've got to work from the power base that we do have and the networks we have. And that is within the art and cultural space. So Kayla calls for an action. And if you don't mind, Wesley, I would like to read it. And I know that this is going to go up on as part of the record. And if everyone's can bear with me, um, I'd, I'd like, you, like to take a moment to, to read this as a call for action. Um, and um, sorry, I'll just uh, pull it up so that I can read it here so bear with me and i'll, I'll um so i can see on the slide it, it, it's it's a reduced version of it but i'll read the full page that wesley has a copy of in front of him so i'll start our families across australia are now hopefully in isolation in cities townships and remote communities faced with the threat of COVID 19 which could in a matter of weeks wipe out the last of our living libraries of traditional knowledge holders surviving having survived for over sixty thousand years Many of us claim our personal identity on Aboriginality via descent from an apical or a family or an elder line. The expression of that identity is usually in the form of language, knowledge of country, spirituality, law and ritual practice, and recognised in their society as being one of them. Much of this Aboriginal identity is seen in the public space displayed in artworks like on canvases, dance work, songs, stories, artefacts and totemic designs, including in the new media. This is the Aboriginal arts and cultural industry that we are part of. Faced with this clear and present danger of COVID-19, the real possibility of massive losses across this country of our living libraries who are our, our knowledge holders is upon us. Make no mistake. How are we as art and cultural practitioners and industry professionals who draw upon these libraries for content and directioners responding? I propose that we work to establish a way to record people's own family living library knowledge in a massive way across this nation. I propose that this is done through family members using at home while they're in isolation, using their iPhones or any other devices and to upload it to a collection point using the very best technology available and platform as, and the personality that we can muster. In return, I propose that we pay per minute for content we receive this money earned will be spent by the families to survive this crisis in, in paying of food, fuel, hygiene measures and communications costs. Now, what are the outcomes of such a proposal? 
Younger, one, younger family members are incentivized to record their own knowledge that underpins their personal, uh, personal identity and get them engaging with their old people while this isolation lockdown exists. Two, we capture the last of this ancient knowledge while we can. And three, the money earned from the uploads is used for the cost of daily survival for these people. The sourcing of funding. I think this requires leadership at the federal and state levels and our indigenous senators, Aboriginal affairs ministers and senior indigenous advisory committee members now we all, that we all know that they need to act now. Not next week, they have to act now. This is the leadership that I'm talking about that has been demonstrated by elders like Joe Brown. I, I request that the Australia Council commits resources to shape the strategy and design this to present to government for funding. This is a response I'm looking for. We have the expertise, technology and, identified the, and have identified the rationale for such a proposal. And I call upon all those present on this platform to support this initiative and bring to bear all our available resources to address this our dire need. Now why? If we lose the libraries, we lose the fountain, we lose the cultural well that we all draw upon to, to, to create the works that we do. We cannot justifiably stand on our watch and say we did not do enough. And we allowed 60,000 years of living history and culture to disappear because of this virus. And while we stood there silent, we didn't it didn't happen. So I'm calling upon the support of all. And, I, um, and I'll leave it there, Wesley. Thank you for, for your oh, time. Well, and Leanne as well, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Wayne, many people on the chat line just giving their full support. Uh, I must admit, I was moved to tears at one point. Uh, just the idea of losing all this knowledge, it's, it's a very big, big, important thing and a good reason to say we need to look after our elders and be very, very vigilant about this. Um, a couple of questions to ask about, um, uh, Leanne, can I hand to you just for a second, please? Hi, Wesley, yes, yes. Oh, uh, look, Wayne, thank you so much. Um, you know, through the work that we've been doing at the Australia Council, one of the, you know, greatest things that I think from a funding perspective is hearing that sense of urgency across the country um, with our elders uh, and young people. And in terms of the practice, you know, putting Australia Council aside, a lot of my work's been based out in the APY lands and, and hearing from senior cultural bosses out there the importance of young people sitting down with them to have that exchange of cultural knowledge. Um, you know, there's, um, there's issues happening right across our country. Um, I certainly hear what you're saying um, in, I think that's a fantastic idea of getting young people while in isolation to be recording the stories of their elders. Um, I mean, let's hope that we don't face such enormous loss uh, in our cultural knowledge base. Um, it's certainly something that I will take back to Lydia. Lydia and I, in particular, have been talking about this issue um, and b before you brought it to us. And um, one of the fantastic pr funding programs that we do have that is incredibly successful, and as you know, Wayne, is the Chosen program. Yes. Uh, and Chosen, where we put the... Um, we put the... Uh, Elders, elders have the authority to choose who they want to pass their cultural knowledge on to. And um, it's been hugely successful um, around the country. So there is capacity, I think, for us to look and whether it's looking at Chosen itself and ramping that up um, to another level uh, in response to what you're doing now. But you know, certainly know that Lydia and I will continue offline having conversations around this with you and, um, and bringing it back uh, to the community, um, you know, uh, next week when we have, have more discussions around it. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things is, is, you know, is Australians cherish Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts. Well, let's see that in action for your call of action and um, and let's see what we can draw together and put our heads together to do something around this. And 
it forms a part of the resilience package, I think, that the Australia Council is doing. So certainly, um, Leah and I have got it on our agenda and we'll continue conversations with you around that. And um, we'll, we'll inform others as we travel along uh, to get this in, in now. Wayne, thank you so much for that. It's um, this, you, this call for action that will make sure that it goes up uh, as part of the resources of what's going on with these kind of chats and conversation as well. And great to hear Leanne about how the Australia Council could um, help build this up over time as well. Um, Wayne, I have one question though. Where, where do you think these uploads would go? Would they have to go to a central place or do you have any kind of thinking around that at this point in time? Well, I was encouraged by Travis's um, presentation last week, and I think you know some someone like him could put his put his thinking caps on around all of that. But it's absolutely the responsibility of each family to to do this, obviously, and and they will they will hold the, the data in their own phones or whatever media devices that they have. But the thing is that, you know, Aboriginal history and Aboriginal culture belongs to all of us. You know, and we have a direct, whether you're from the Kimberley, Central Australia, South Australia, wherever you are, this is our collective legacy. We, we need to own and protect this. We, we, we fight so hard for land rights. We fight so hard for the flag. We, without cultural practice and without the, the, the foundation to who we are as the First Nations people, all of those other things have little meaning. It has little meaning for those people who are living today. If you can imagine if we lose all our living library within the next couple of months, mm. what is the future going to look like for us as Indigenous people? Mm. You know? Agreed. Agreed. You know, yeah, it, uh, it is absolutely fundamental we do this. And Wayne, if we want to kind of uh, engage in some of this discussion and debate, is it best to go to like the Calac w uh, website or if we're seeing some of these documents that we want to connect with, is there a place to go? Uh, Yes, but look, for us, it's, it's early days. We do what we do on the ground with the capacity that we have. What, what we're looking for is leadership. We, we have in this forum, there are men and women in this group that are listening to us that have the skill sets and some ideas. What I'm looking for, Wesley, from you guys is, is a way to co uh, coalesce all this stuff and put it together into a think tank. And I'm looking for someone to put their hand up and says, I'll have, have to put some ideas about how this might happen. Right. Yeah. Well, let's let's take that on board, and I think there's lots of support. If you're if you're asking for support there, Wayne, I think many Indeed. people in the chat room saying they're putting their hand up and they're saying yes, yes, we should support this. People giving already suggestions of where's a good place to hold this, like IATSIS, uh, maybe within community state archives or libraries where there's already First Nations uh, holding places for that. There's also some some work. Um, Marunga's talking about the Wayne Weaver Foundation, which is looking at supporting cultural community care for Indigenous elders, looking at a proposal in a similar way. Um, we do need to move on, but I think that this is a much bigger issue that isn't going to go thank away you. quickly. And Wayne, thank you so much. And I'm sorry that I kind of uh, was overcome at one point. I think it's a very big and important issue. Um, Happens to me every day, Wesley. Yeah, yeah. Might hand over Leanne to introduce our last guest. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. So our, our final speaker is Professor Kerry Arabina. Uh, Kerry is the Managing Director of Carabina uh, Consulting. And um, have we got you here, Kerry? Oh, oh, hi, Kerry. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for the welcome and the introduction, and also um, to the other panelists, your views around wisdom and reverence I think are really critical and to the arts and cultural community it is you who are going to bring us back from this kind of hell. So I'm just wondering if I can start off the presentation with just a small meditation if at all possible. Um, I just found this, this is something that is really striking me. We use the words self-isolation but perhaps what we might be able to do is use a different kind of reflection, which is that this is um, an opportunity for self-reverence and self-reflection and understanding who we are and how we need to be in the world. So if you can just bear with me a little bit before we actually talk about cultural determinants of health and some of the other initiatives that are happening in this space online that you can all join up with, I'd be very grateful. You are born. You build yourself piece by piece. You construct a narrative. You become an individual surrounding yourself with all that you love. You are wounded too, sometimes, and left scarred. 
yet you become a heroic and unique embodiment of both the things that you cherish and the things that cause you pain. As you grow into this living idea, you become instantly recognisable among the billions of faces in the world. You become that which who you think you are. You stand before the world and say, I am here and this is who I am. But there is an influence at work, a veiled magnetic force, an unnamed yearning drawing you towards a seismic event. It has always been there, patiently waiting. This event holds within it a sudden and terrifying truth. You were never the thing that you thought you were. You are an illusion as the event shatters you into a multitude of pieces. The pieces of you spin apart a million little histories propelling themselves away at a tremendous rate. They become like hurtling stars, points of retreating light, separated only by your roaring need and the distant sky itself. You scramble for the pieces of your shattered history. There is a frantic gathering up. The unbelievable fragments have begun to put yourselves back together again. You re reassemble yourself into something that seems absolutely foreign to you, yet fully and instantly recognisable. You stand anew, remade. You have rebuilt yourself, but you are different. You have become a we, a we are each other, a vast community of astonishing potential that holds the sky aloft with our suffering that keeps the stars in place with our limitless joy, that situates the moon within the reaches of our gratitude and positions us in the locus of the divine. Together we are reborn. And I truly believe that that is the potential, the price and the promise of what this virus and everything that has gone on before and everything that will happen again is facilitating for us. It's an opportunity for us to become something more than who we thought we are and how we can all be together. And both of the past speakers spoke about the power of community and the potential that we have to really um, build each other up and to provide a caring, kind, supportive community that has embodied in it the ability for all of us to care for ourselves, to exercise when we can, um, and to be kind to ourselves. And that's actually really very important for all of us right now. So to the next side, please, if we can. One of the things that I have always been able to use when we've spoken about, cult, um, about rebuilding ourselves or understanding the very important foundations of who we are and how we be and who we can be together for us as being around our culture. And I want to just give you a little bit of a heads up about a webcast series that we're running with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across Australia. And these webcasts are going to be made available um, on an ongoing basis. It is being done in partnership between my consulting company, Carabina Consulting, um, Social Futures, as well as the Centre for Healthcare Knowledge and Innovation. And what we're doing is really focusing on how we can engage with culture as a healing and how we can build resilience through cultural practice. And I'm really pleased that both of the previous panelists spoke very strongly about the importance and power of our living libraries and what it is that we can do. So what we're doing through this webcast series is exploring a range of themes around governance strategy, tools and capacity building. And what we're doing is really um, thinking about what our practices are and how we can innovate what it is that we do and encouraging some very frank discussions on the connections between health and well-being, culture and truth-telling um, and what it is that we need to be connected to at this point in time. So if we can have the next slide, please. I don't know about any of you, but none of this bloody business that's been happening during 2020 was on my vision board. I don't know if it's on anyone else's. However, I really do think that it is a time to connect all of our hearts and minds to land and country. And so I am really interested to think about um, what our relationships to land and country are and how complex and interrelated they are. 
as Joshua said, this is a really stunningly successful virus in that it's been able to species hop and then stay within the one species. And as Joshua said, we don't have any inner resilience toward these animal or zoonotic diseases that transmit between people. And there are a whole range of other things that are happening at the beginning of this century, which we need to be mindful for. It's because uh, we're at the beginning of the Anthropocene now, which is a new human epoch. It is a new geological age where the power of one species has become the force of nature. It is the way that our behaviours, rampant consumerism, all of those different kinds of things that we're meant to need, want and desire, have actually brought this planet and all of the planetary systems to the brink of existence as we know it. And pandemics such as this one will be much more common and they will be much more frequent and they will have a significant bearing to take on our planet and ourselves as a species, but also our other kith and kin that we share this time and space with. And that's why I think what we really do need to assert very strongly is our connections to country, our ways of living, being, knowing and doing in the world, our senses of community and how respectful we are to spirituality, our ancestors and to our social interactions and how we engage in these experiences of abundance, which are absolutely embedded within our culture and our communities. Now, to all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who at the commencement of this year have had to suffer through the bushfires, having lost over a billion of the animals endemic to different places, those entities that we've co-evolved with over the 60,000 years, I just can't imagine how heart sore we are with all of those experiences and then coming into having to look after our living libraries. But what I'm hoping that we can do and I'm encouraging all of us to share is what it is that underpins our culture and gives us the good, strong sense of health and well-being. So what we've got now are a series of seminars where we'll be exploring with people in very dynamic ways about our connections to land and country, spirituality and ancestors, including the cosmologies that we use and how we're connected to skies, to soils, to the magma in the middle of the earth, to the larger reaches of the universe. And, um, and those kinds of things I think are really very important as well. Um, what we're also doing is looking at how we can build amongst not only our communities, but all communities to have a healthy respect for the power of spirit and the power of the people's genius who've walked on this continent for over 100,000 years and what it is that we can take as learnings from those knowledge systems into the way we live this life in the 21st century. We're also focusing then on the roles and responsibilities and cultural obligations that we have between our families and among our kinship relationships and how we need to extend those between beyond a single species view to actually take into account those that, who are our totems, um, those that we have affinity with, places that can us, that ignite the fire within us, and also then to have a deep and sincere respect for our bodies and minds. Um, at this point in time, while we're self-isolating, it would be very easy to put into our bodies things that were not going to benefit us or our communities, but to think about what it is that we can do to heal, to nourish ourselves, to nourish our wellness, to settle our minds and to be in our love, in our hearts, I think is going to be so critically important at the moment. What we're finding with a lot of the workforce who are used to going out into our communities and engaging on a face-to-face -face way is that the work practices has changed so significantly that people now feel guilty. The burden of guilt is quite significant. Um, people are not understanding how to do work through a screen-based interface when they have been used to working and engaging with people very closely and having those strong face-to-face -face 
relationships. As Wes said, he is a hugger. I am a hugger as well. Um, but finding different ways in which we can spend times connecting to each other is going to be critically important, as is looking after our own mental health and well-being. And we can do that if we practice self-care, listen to relaxation music, drink a lot of water because that hydrates us at a, at a very cellular level and helps us um, rehydrate so that we can make good decisions going forward. And also then just being able to practice culture in whatever way we can, whether that is just going out and grabbing a eucalyptus leaf and, and crunching it up in front of your face so you can smell it. It's about being able to um, go out and reach out to all of the elements through a YAPA practice. It could be about developing up a vision board for you and your children to think about what goals and opportunities you would like to have um, throughout the next year and to also then just to practice the diary, uh, which is what some other people have talked about um, bringing online too. So we've been doing WIAPA practices all over the place. It's a visualization and a meditation. They are being offered regularly online, along with this webcast series, as well as many others. So we'd be very happy to share this information with all of you and, um, and also then just see where we can get to during these very important times. That's and probably it for the, the presentation. Slide. If we go to the next slide there, Michelle, there's that, um, there's a website uh, yes. there. Sorry, Kerry, every now and then we may have lost some video or, or uh, you know, the, the ills of trying to do all this online. Um, as you can see, it can be kind of a bit tricky at times. Um, and I think my video is lost at the moment as well. But th this wonderful thing of connecting, and if anything, what you're really saying to me is look after yourself, look after your family, look after your culture, look after your land because that's what's going to keep us going through. We've got someone here, uh, Marilyn Miller, in fact, there we go, uh, saying that we're, we're seeing an increase in, in violence in the home a lot, and uh, especially with a lot of triggers and things. What, what kind of advice you might have for techniques to deal with these kind of triggerings of um, violence and things as well? That's a very big question, and it's a really important one to acknowledge, but it is truly um, about addressing some of these chronic stressors that we have and about um, how we spend the time together and trying to do that as wisely as we possibly can. But this is also really harming a lot of our families because they are losing work. Um, they've got adult children who've had to return home because their scholarships have been continuing or they've been um, taken out of their hospitality jobs. It is a deeply challenging time for all of us and all of Australians. It's not only our communities who are experiencing an increase in the rate of domestic violence, it is everyone who is experiencing this increase. Um, but that's where we can start to think about, well, what is it that we can do to engage our families our, our, um, and consolidate the relationships that we have between each other? And this is, I think, a very important way to be able to keep connected. Um, stay in touch with each other. Stay in touch with ourselves. Talk what our truth is. And for men to be able to open up to other men and for women to be able to open up to other women, there are a whole range of counselling and other services available online at the moment. And just to be able to reach out to everyone and have that frank discussion about, look, I'm really feeling on edge today. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid I'm going to harm someone if I can't get this out of my system. Just just picking up the phone and talking to someone before resulting uh, before resorting to that rapid escalation of violence that we all experience when we're on edge in the way that we are. Yeah, yeah. Take, take a walk outside, count to ten, you know, and then. We've got a couple of minutes just before we finish up. We've got Debbie Higginson there who's put her hand up and this is a new uh, format that we've got and see if it works this time that, um, that we've got Debbie Higginson with her hand up who's going to ask a question live. Um, is Debbie there? See if that's going to work. No, it doesn't, doesn't look like that's going to work. All right, well... Oh, there you go. Debbie, you're permitted to talk. Nope, not going to work. All right, look, we're going to run out of time there. Uh, Kerry, thank you so much. It's so important that we have 
this time to talk about and speak about the things that are important to us and, and how to nurture ourselves. This is the next, uh, next slide for us. Thanks, Michelle. The uh, pulse check, just this idea of how is everyone feeling? I mean, if what Kerry was saying is anything to go by, we do need these times out to kind of think and, and um, reflect on what's important to us. We're having a few technical issues at the moment with, with cameras and sound, so bear with us, but I think everyone's still out there in the world. Uh, send me a little message on the, in the chat if you can to just talk a little bit about what you're doing. I don't know about you, but sleep is one of those issues that I'm having at the moment. I can't actually work on time and space. It all seems to be collapsing and, and sleep seems to be, um, even though I, I, I am getting more sleep than I've ever had, I'm waking up tired, which is interesting. Um, there's also some conversation here, people talking about wanting to get hold of uh, Josh. I think Felicity, you were wanting to get hold of Josh um, and have a little uh, chat with him about his work, especially your work, right. especially in, in disability. So there might be something there. Um, if we just go to, yes, other people saying feeling restless. Um, Nancy, thank you, love. Thank you for that. And if we go to the next slide, just about what's next, we're doing this um, for the next few weeks. Next week uh, is on a Thursday because it's going to be um, uh, Easter, on, uh, Good Friday on the Friday. So we're going to look at doing it on the Thursday. So it's really good to, to do that. I just might take this time. Um, I think Leanne's there. I've lost her video. Can you, can oh, you hear me, Wesley? I can hear you, though. I can hear you, love. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. I've, yeah, I don't. There's a bandwidth um, issue at the moment. Oh, no. Here we go. Oh, you're back in? Oh, beautiful. There you go. Oh, your lovely face. So good to see <laughs> your beautiful face. Maybe just to say a big thank you to Kerry, Wayne and Josh for their really heartfelt, really important um, um, statements. They, they talk to us at the moment. Yes, number of people saying they're stress eating. Yep, I know that feeling. Not exercising enough. But thank and you. animals do that too. My cat's doing it. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. Um, look, Wesley, um, thank, I, I too want to extend my thanks to Wayne and um, Josh and Kerry as well. Just remember, everyone, that this is being recorded. Uh, this will be posted to the Australia Council website. Encourage others who have, might have left early or couldn't um, ring in today um, and log on. Uh, it's all there available. Um, will there be... I guess, Wesley, is there contact details? Um, you were saying that people would like to talk to Josh or connect with Kerry. Well, uh, we might, we'll, we'll see if Josh has a website or something to connect yeah. with. Just for privacy reasons, we shouldn't give it out on, online here. Cool. But um, we'll, um, I guess, Google their names as a starting point. But if we'll ask their permission and see. We've, we've run out of time rapidly, so we might just move us on. We will pick up this next week. We'll have new topics to, to look at, especially um, uh, some of the issues around mental health and cultural health. With the next slide that we have is just looking at, there's the Australia Council's website. This, just this very now, this right now, uh, it's gone live, the resilience package. So have a look at that. The Australia Council roundtables, the recordings and the information that have come through. Um, also look at the information that's coming from the government around uh, COVID-19, especially in terms of health um, issues and some of the employment strategies that we're talking about. And there's a Facebook group that's worth looking at, the Arts and Creative Industries Digital Support. And the next slide for us, thanks. Um, there, a lot of support there to look after yourself. We, Beyond Blue, um, we'll actually have some other links as well and resources in Indigenous languages if you uh, need to access that in a different way or you know people in your life. Uh, and also uh, some Indigenous communities in remote areas, some, some language things there. We'll be wrapping it up, but just wanted to say thank you very much. We had, uh, there's 130 of us still online at this very moment. And just to know that it's all recorded so you can actually go and look after um, this, this information by passing it on to others, getting people to, to look at that. Um, also remember, please, physical distancing is important. If you're a hugger like me, restrain, hug yourself, give yourself a hug, that's really important and social solidarity and virtual sovereignty to look after all of those things. Leanne, thank you very much. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you. And we'll, thank you to everyone. We'll find our rhythm. Yes. Well, I think technically we had a little bit of issue, but next week you're on your own. I won't be here. So you'll, oh, okay, you'll well, have your own rhythm. You'll be beautiful. Be gentle. Um, <laughs> beautiful. Hello and goodbye to all those wonderful people. 
And a big thank you to all the team at the Australia Council for having this idea and really pursuing it. And I wanted to say that it's such an important thing to look after yourself, look after your family, look after your culture and your land, that that's the way we'll get through this. And um, uh, all of this resource will be up on the Australia Council website very soon. All right, thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Wesley. See you, everyone.